Today we'll be discussing axillary management of node positive breast cancer after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Let's start with a case study. We have a 59 year old postmenopausal female who initially presented with screening detected right breast cancer. Her medical history was significant for a previously biopsied subareolar mass deemed benign and stable. Family history was negative for breast or ovarian cancer. Physical exam confirmed the presence of this known subareolar mass, but was also notable for a palpable right axillary lymph node with the location shown in this diagram. The patient subsequently underwent a diagnostic mammogram and axillary ultrasound, which showed a hypoechoic lobulated mass at the 10 o'clock position, eight centimeters from the nipple, measuring 0.9 centimeters, as well as a likely replaced axillary lymph node at the 10 o'clock position, 12 centimeters from the nipple, measuring 1.4 centimeters. An ultrasound-guided core biopsy of both the breast mass and lymph node was performed which demonstrated grade three invasive ductal carcinoma, which was weekly ER positive, PR negative, and HER2 negative by FISH, with a KI67 greater than 60%. Axillary metastasis was confirmed. Mammoprint testing stratified the tumor as high risk, with a 10-year risk of recurrence estimated at 29%. Bilateral breast MRI confirmed these findings and identified no other suspicious lymph nodes. PET-CT was negative for metastatic disease. On initial consultation in multidisciplinary clinic, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, or NAC, was recommended given the biopsy-proven positive lymph node and phenotypically triple negative biology. With regard to local regional management, we discussed that she was a candidate for either breast conserving therapy or mastectomy, and that both options had similar oncologic outcomes. But how did we advise management of the axilla in this node-positive patient set to undergo chemotherapy? Historically speaking, all patients with clinically node-positive breast cancer underwent axillary lymph node dissection. However, it was shown that anywhere from 40 to 60% of patients sustained a pathologic complete response after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, as in no residual cancer was found in the surgical specimen. Axillary dissection in these patients thus may increase morbidity without providing any potential benefit. This prompted consideration of sentinel lymph node biopsy for patients with a good clinical response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Why avoid axillary dissection and opt for sentinel lymph node biopsy instead? Not only does axillary dissection result in more pain and a longer recovery, but 15 to 30% of patients later develop lymphedema and long-term sensory changes, which is a source of significant morbidity and can affect the quality of life. Z1071, a multicenter cohort trial, set to address this question. Specifically, the study aimed to evaluate the false negative rate, or FNR, for sentinel lymph node biopsies in node-positive patients who undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy. In other words, how often did the sentinel lymph node specimen yield no cancerous contents when the axillary dissection actually did? All adult women with T0 through 4, N1 or 2, M0 invasive breast cancer who had completed or were planning to complete neoadjuvant chemotherapy were enrolled. Patients underwent sentinel lymph node biopsy, followed by an axillary lymph node dissection, and the specimens were evaluated by pathology. The investigators posed a threshold FNR of 10%, the expected false negative rate for clinically node negative women undergoing sentinel lymph node biopsy. With this study, they seek to determine whether the FNR of sentinel lymph node biopsy was less than 10% for women with CN1 disease who had greater than two sentinel nodes examined, which would potentially support the use of sentinel lymph node biopsy over axillary dissection in this cohort. Of the 756 women enrolled, 663 women met criteria and had CN1 disease. Of those, 525 women had two or more sentinel nodes identified and completed an axillary lymph node dissection. 215 patients sustained a pathologic complete response with no invasive carcinoma detected in the sentinel node or axillary dissection specimens. Of the remaining 310 patients with residual nodal disease, 39 patients had a falsely negative sentinel lymph node specimen, yielding a false negative rate of 12.6%. 
on bivariable analysis, the likelihood of having a false negative sentinel node was significantly decreased when dual mapping agents, like both dye and radioisotope, were used, and when at least three sentinel lymph nodes were examined. Overall, the study did not observe a false negative rate under 10%, and thus concluded that changes in approach and patient selection would be necessary before supporting the use of sentinel lymph node biopsy as an alternative to axillary dissection. Other studies, like Sentina or SNFNAC, that were also ongoing at the time corroborated these findings. The investigators then took it one step further and performed a subgroup analysis on the original 1071 cohort, looking specifically at patients who had a clip place in the metastatic lymph node at the time of initial biopsy. The correlation between lymph node identified on initial ultrasound and the sentinel lymph node identified at surgery had not yet been fully evaluated. The investigators asked, how frequently is the clipped node in the sentinel lymph node biopsy versus the axillary dissection? And how does this affect the false negative rate? Of the original cohort of 525 patients meeting the primary endpoint criteria, 170 had a clip placed at initial nodal biopsy. Of those, 141 patients had their clip identified and confirmed on specimen radiograph or pathology. 76% of those patients had a clip found in their sentinel node specimen, and 24% in the axillary dissection specimen. In those cases where the clip was found in the sentinel lymph node, the FNR was 6.8%. In those cases where the clip was identified in the axillary dissection, the false negative rate was 19%. Since the data on whether the clipped node was positive or negative in the cases where the clip node was part of the axillary dissection contents was unknown in about half the cases, the investigators were unable to assess the FNR with a strategy of sentinel lymph node plus resection of the clip node. A related study at MD Anderson evaluated this, adding all patients with biopsy-confirmed nodal metastasis who had a clip placed to a prospective registry between 2011 and 2015. Patients receiving neoadjuvant chemotherapy were included. The registry did not mandate any specific axillary surgery be performed, but the standard at the time was to perform axillary lymph node dissection in this cohort unless the patient was in a different clinical trial. They developed a novel surgical technique, targeted axillary dissection, which involves removal of the sentinel lymph nodes and localized clip node. An I-125C was placed in the clip node by a breast radiologist one to five days prior to surgery under ultrasound guidance. On the left, you see a mammogram performed after seed placement, showing the clip and the seed within the node. On the right, you see the removed node with specimen radiograph showing that both the clip and the seed have been removed. 208 patients were enrolled. As you can see here, they were able to calculate the false negative rates using different approaches. One, using the clipped node alone to predict nodal status. Two, using the sentinel node biopsy alone to predict nodal status. And three, using the targeted axillary dissection specimen to predict nodal status. Using the clipped node alone to predict the presence of residual disease yielded a false negative rate of 4.2%. Using the sentinel nodes alone yielded a false negative rate of 10.1%. Adding evaluation of the clip nodes to this lowered the FNR to 1.4%. Using the targeted axillary dissection specimens to predict the presence of residual disease yielded an FNR of 2%. So how did the last few papers apply to our original case study? As a refresher, we had a 57-year-old female with CT1N1 right invasive ductal carcinoma with phenotypically triple negative disease. She ended up undergoing savvy scout localization of the right breast cancer and the metastatic lymph node shortly after the initial surgical consultation. She completed four cycles of AC and 12 cycles of Taxol. And on her mid-chemo visit, she was found to have a normal axillary exam with ultrasound confirming an excellent response to chemotherapy. So how did we proceed? She pursued breast conserving surgery, and for her axilla, we performed a targeted axillary dissection. Intraoperative frozen section was negative for residual disease, and thus no axillary dissection was performed. Final pathology confirmed three lymph nodes, all negative for metastatic carcinoma. In summary, these studies prove the utility in targeted axillary dissection, 
demonstrating that a less invasive approach to axillary management may be considered as an alternative to axillary dissection in situations in which the likelihood of false negatives is low. <laughs>